Samuel 19. It's good to have my wife back. Man, I thought I had a visitor, and I looked at Glad she's able to be here. Amen. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel 19, uh, verse 10 and 11. And uh, we'll look there tonight for just a few moments. Like I say, welcome to our Facebook audience. 1 First, First Samuel 19, verse 10. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the songs, uh, Lord, you've allowed us to sing. Thank you for the physical health that you've allowed us to be here. And uh, Lord, we pray for those that are not able to return yet. I remember, I think of Elaine, I pray that we'd see her soon, Lord, and everyone would be able to be back here in the house of God. Thank you for these that were with us this morning. And uh, tonight's another night. And uh, Lord, uh, here we are in need again. And we ask now that you would uh, speak to our hearts from the Bible. Bless the fellowship afterwards. And Father, I promise you for what you do, we'll love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, what I want to call the repelling of sin. Once again, Saul is going to be stopped from killing David. And David is going to uh, receive help. It is hot in here, Brother Marty. They're saying it's hot. Bless us with the air condition, my brother. Uh, if it's hot, say amen. amen. It's hot. All right. But the Lord, the Lord has seen fit to help David again here. And he's going to repel. He's going to keep the sin off of David's life again through one of Saul's own family member. Now, you don't have to turn there. But if you look in chapter 19, uh, in, in verse 1, here again, Saul is trying to kill David, and God intervenes, and God uses Jonathan, Saul's own son, to stand against Saul and to keep uh, Saul from murdering David. Well, time has passed. Saul uh, got back into his old ways. The evil spirit from God, the Bible said that, has now visited Saul again. And Saul's thinking on the jealousy. He's going to try to kill David again. He throws the javelin and misses him. And after that, somehow or another, he plots out a murderous plot by using Michael. If you'll recall Saul's words, he said, And I gave her to him, speaking of Michael, to David to be a snare unto him. In other words, I've given my daughter to, to uh, David that through her some way, if I need to, I might be able to kill him. So here's another time of Saul's family members who comes out and takes up and is used of God to preserve David's life. I, I want to remind you that God, friend, God can raise up friends to help his people from unexpected sources. You wouldn't think that the king's uh, daughter and son would both stand against him, but they did. Why did they, preacher? Because of God and how God repels sin in our life. How the Lord has the ability to raise up people uh, to help you and I when sin is setting a course to devastate our life. Let me give you another example. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got time. Just turn there if, we, if you would. Look in the book of Exodus, please. Exodus chapter 2. In Exodus chapter 2, all of us are familiar with this story, but if you have your Bible, I'll give you time to turn there. Exodus chapter 2, and we'll, uh, let's just look in verse 1. And there went out, if you got it there, say amen. If you don't, Sunday school's 945 on Sunday morning. Amen. You learn the books of the Bible. Uh, but uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, there went out a man of the house of Levi and took wife of the daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. 
And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hold him, remember now in the latter part of verse 1, I should say, verse 22, Pharaoh put out a charge that all the males, young males, would be killed in the land. And when she could no longer hide him, she had hid Moses, she took him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's, uh, river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would happen, uh, what would be done with him. And the daughter of Pharaoh, now watch it, stay with me, you're going to miss it. Chapter 1, verse 22, Pharaoh puts out a charge to kill all the males in, in the land. Chapter 2, all of a sudden, here comes God, and God uses another unexpected source to help his people. Pharaoh's daughter is drawn by the providence of God to the brink of the river, and the Bible says that she looks on the child and has compassion on the babe. Here God raised up an unexpected source to repel the sin. One man said it something along this line. Listen to this. God can, cur uh, can cause evil to furnish the means to destroy its own opposition in the, to God. God can, God, listen to this. God can cause evil to furnish its own means to destroy its opposition to God. Hey, look, it was God's will for David to be king. And, 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 and evil comes in, rears up Jonathan, then rears up, my, uh, rears up Jonathan and rears up Michael to totally repel the sin away from God. Somebody said, I don't know what that word repel means, preacher. Well, if you ever do any deer hunting, I'm preaching now. You go, if you go deer hunting in, the, in bow hunting, Brother Mark, if you ever go bow hunting, I've got me what's called a therma, a therma. what is it, David, a therma, a uh, one of them little thermo, anyway, let me just tell you what it is, okay? It's a little thing, and it's got a little chemical in it, and it's got a little propane, propane tank in it, and it's got like one of these incense strips, and you light that rascal, and within 200, 300 square foot, one of them mosquitoes won't come out. They, they see me up in that stand. They're like them deer. Them deer look up and say, oh, now what's that? <laughs> Big old fella up there. But uh, those mosquitoes look at me like a buffet sitting in the, <laughs> and I mean, hey, man, if one of them gets you, they tell all of them, and I mean, they're just buzzing in on you. Well, that thermosail, that's what it is, thermosail, when you get it up there, you push a button, well, it fires up a little propane tank, which burns that incense, which put off, puts off a repellent scent, and them rascals won't touch you, Brother Greg. I mean, they'll come close. But you can hear them threatening, but they'll never get there because there's a repellent. God repels sin in David's life from Jonathan, Saul's own son, Michael, and then, lo and behold, he raised up, uh, if you will, Pharaoh's daughter, to uh, protect Moses. Again, let me say this. God can curse evil, can cause evil rather, God can cause evil to furnish the means to destroy its own opposition to God. Amen or oh me. Hey, this ought to encourage you and I, friend. Why? Because look, someone can do us wrong, they can be uh, mad at us, or they can be trying to cause us harm. And I'm going to tell you something, if God has allowed that to happen, don't you leave out Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God to those that are called according to his purpose. Sometimes God will allow things to happen in our life that he might show us uh, that he's strong on our behalf. You ever had the Lord do something for you? Can you imagine being David? And knowing that you're fixing to die, he just threw a javelin at David just days before Jonathan had stood to Saul. And he said, what hath he done? Why would you try to uh, hurt innocent blood? What cause? What has he done, Dad? That you And God takes unexpected sources in our lives. And he can, get, he can cause us to have friends we've never even met before. Here, lo and behold... 
Pharaoh stood in front of the entire nation and put a charge out that every male must die. And here's Moses, his mama, broken hearted, doesn't know how her child is ever going to make it. And God said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just touch the heart of the Pharaoh's daughter and I'll have her to have much compassion on the babe. Matter of fact, the goodness of God spreads here to this point. He not only repelled sin in Moses' life, but he blessed Moses' family abundantly. He told, he, he had the Pharaoh's daughter tell this, hey, don't only bring the maid to, 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 to feed the child, but I'm going to pay her wages while she does it. Amen. Glory be to God. You don't go wrong doing God's will. David was doing God's will. And God took the evil that was opposing his will, friend, and he caused it to furnish the means to accomplish his will. He's good at that. Amen. Well, not only do you see the repelling of sin, I'm going to try to move quickly. We got, hey, when it's taco night, friend, you preach fast, Brother Mark. I believe you can find that in the Bible if you look real close. <laughs> I mean, hey, hey, if it's there, I'd amen it, wouldn't you, Brother Dave? Tacos, brother, glory be to God, is in tacos, amen, no doubt about it. Tomatoes and lettuce and cheese and sour, I'm preaching now, ain't I, Christine? Glory be to you believe God's in tacos? I do, amen. <laughs> I like tacos. Brother Chuck, you like tacos? I believe the providence of God's been good to us tonight, don't you? But anyhow, hey, it's all right to laugh a little bit. I want you to see the revealing of sin, chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 1. Scripture tells us here that uh, Michael's aware, but it doesn't tell us how Michael finds out. We don't really know how God made it aware to Michael that Saul was trying to kill David. Scripture's not clear about that, but I'll tell you one thing it is clear about. It's clear about it that she knew it, Amen. And you say, what's your thought, preacher? Well, my thought is this. God has no problem exposing sin, friend. He don't have no problem at all. And when he sees it, he can get it across to you or to me or to whoever's trying to harm us. And the Lord here, he exposes the will of Saul to Michael. And uh, don't forget, the Lord has his way of exposing sin. Be sure your sin will find you out, friend. Hey, look, nothing's hid from the eyes of whom we have to behold. Everything is naked and open under the eyes of God. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open under their cry. God sees everything, friend. He saw the intentions of the king's heart. The king's heart's in the hand of the Lord. He turn it whithersoever he will. And God stopped. Now, how did he do it through? We remember how he, how he exposed it to uh, Jonathan. Uh, scripture does tell that. Saul calls a public meeting. And he makes the statement, chapter 19, I believe it is. And he tells Jonathan that he is going to kill David. Providence, the pull of providence, out of uh, Saul's heart, Pulls out the wicked intentions. He'll say, now I want to give you something here uh, that I think is very, very, uh, th th this is an open door for me to hit this. Have you ever had somebody say something to you and they'll laugh and they'll just say, oh, I'm just kidding. No, they're not. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I didn't mean that. Here Saul is. He steps up and says he's going to kill David. Guess what? He meant it. He meant it. It come out of his heart. We ought to be very careful what comes out of us, friend. And be very, hey, we ought, to use, we ought to use caution. And not only caution, but there's much prudence in listening to people when they say things. They'll tell, matter of fact, if you, if you and I learn to listen, people tell you everything they're going. You, you just listen. I had somebody today just go on and on about a subject. and I just sit there and listen. I said, oh, okay, all right. We'll be praying about it. Be praying for you. Uh, they'll tell you right where they're at. They'll take you right where they're at. You know what? It's okay to tell somebody you love them. I love my church. Amen. Church, I love you. I appreciate you. And I can say that. I mean that out of my heart. I'm not just telling you I love you. I love you. Amen. Amen. It's okay to tell people you love them. But if you ever, you know, we see faults in others and we say something to them and we'll just say, well, I'm just kidding. Sometimes they're not. A lot of times they're not. A lot of times, unlike... Um, 
John Butler, I mean not John Butler, but John C. Maxwell made this statement. He said, an attitude, listen, is never content until it is expressed. My, my, my. Sometimes we feel we just got to express how we feel, amen? Sometimes it'd be better off just keeping quiet, wouldn't it? I think we all have that difficulty sometimes. But providence here, the providence of God pulled it out of Jonathan. And Jonathan told David, he said, look, if you don't get out of here, my dad's going to kill you. Matter of fact, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to tell my dad how I really feel. Well, let me give you another thought here. Not only do you see the revealing of sin, but notice uh, as, as we uh, try to uh, wrap her up, amen. Uh, he's preaching now, brother. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the reaping of sin. Look with me in 1 first, first Samuel chapter 18. Go back there and let's look in verse 21. Now, I'll tell you something. It really did take me, uh, and I, I can't say that I know for sure that I've learned it all, but you ever have something happen in your life, and it, it, we call it as like the light went on upstairs, the boom. Oh, is that what that means? You know what I mean? You ever had that experience? You ever been blessed with that and feel like about that big? Man, it took me that long to learn that. There is a law in the New Testament uh, called reaping and sowing. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now we look at that as a negative from a negative point of view. Bless God, he does you wrong. He's going to be done wrong. Amen. I mean, uh, and, and sometimes that's, that's how it is. Uh, but we ought not look at it all the time from a negative point of view. Now, in this text, it is negative. Notice with me in the text that I referred you to. Uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 21. Notice what happens here. 1 Samuel 18. Let me find it here. It reads different from 19. Uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 21. And Saul said... I will, I, I will give him her that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in, in the one of the twain. In other words, oh, I just want you to come into my family, but really he's only given Michael his daughter that he might have an open door if he needs it to kill David. You reap what you sow. Here he expected Michael, his daughter, to be there in loyalty for him to, to, to work out his wicked intentions to kill David, uh, God's man. But instead of Michael killing, uh, uh, working with Saul to kill David, Michael stands up against her own father by the will of God and literally refutes everything Paul tries to do. Literally stops everything Saul, rather, tries to do. Why? Because, listen, Saul, friend, he, uh, he reaped that which he wanted in the lives of others. I wrote a thought here. Saul's plans worked against him rather than for him. Oh, my. And you know what? What do you mean Saul's plans works against him? Well, David now is going to be loved not only in Michael's eyes because she knows the intentions. Matter of fact, she not only tells him, she helps him escape. And, and, and now you've got Jonathan who knows the intentions of David's heart, I mean of Saul's heart to kill David. You've got Michael knowing it. You've got Israel knowing what's going on. They haven't forgotten how David had slain Goliath. And Saul started out with evil intentions to eliminate David. And I'm telling you, this thing that was meant to be a curse for David turned out to be a blessing. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I'm telling you, friend, Michael was intended to be a major curse to David's life. And God took a curse and made it into a blessing. Now you say, preacher, where do you get that from? It's in that text, but I'm going to show you. Turn with me as we look in Deuteronomy. We're getting ready to close. Look with me in the book of Deuteronomy. You have your Bible, Deuteronomy 25, 23, Deuteronomy 23. 
Saul had planned bad for David, but God made it good. Oh my, hey, how we can get along in the things of life when we'll just simply love God and do the will of God. Amen? Just do God's will. Just love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. This is the first and great commandment. Just love the Lord. Don't worry about other people. Do what you know is right to do to please the Lord. God saw meant it for evil. God turned it into good. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Deuteronomy chapter 23, and we're going to close. Deuteronomy 23, and I want you to uh, notice the context. Verse 3, we're talking about the Ammonite and the Moabite. Do you see that? Shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even uh, to their tenth generation. Shall they not enter in the congregation of the Lord uh, forever? Watch this. Watch what God's saying. They're not going in, and this is why. Watch it. Because they met you not with bread or water in the way when you came forth of Egypt. And because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia. Watch this. They paid him to, to do the evil, basically, is what, what the book says. And, and, and they intended to, to use the Balaam to cause much heartache to Israel. Watch it. Mesopotamia to curse thee. Watch it. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing. Why? He turned it into a blessing. Why unto thee? Because the Lord thy God loved thee. My, my, my. <laughs> you will not go wrong loving and serving God. I'm telling you, just get up in the morning and, and just go ahead and make it. By God's grace, I'm going to serve him today. My number one goal starting in the morning, I'm going to have some drama tomorrow. I promise you, pray for me. But you know what? I'm going to love the Lord. And you know what my number one goal tomorrow is? Pray for me. I had uh, uh, some, uh, some granite guys come in, and they said about, about $9,000 worth of granite on top of some cabinets. And so it looked beautiful. I went in there. I looked at that granite. I looked at those cabinets, and I got away and got down the road, and I called the granite lady, and I said, man, your guys did a good job. They really did. It looked good. And uh, it wasn't long, and the customer called me, and, and after she, before she called, she started, you ever get what they call multi-text? I mean, just what they call clusters of text with pictures, just... <laughs> And it was a picture in detail of this $9,000 worth of granite sitting on them cabinet, on them $15,000 worth of cabinets. Well, I'm looking at this, and it's sealed from the bottom. And that stone, that granite had to be slid up under a cabinet tower. It had to be cut accurate, or, or they couldn't get it in it. Well, they had difficulty getting it in there, so they called me. Cabinet guy didn't do his job so uh, properly. And so I told him, I said, you don't have no, no choice but to trim the cabinet. Well, before I got there, they tried to force the granite to go into the cabinet because the cabinet man did not listen to detail to leave me a quarter inch. Not a piece of hair thin. Not a, I call it NASA cuts. <laughs> so when they couldn't get that $9,000 worth of stone in, they forced it, got it in, and move the cabinet. Now the angles in it. Are you with me? The angles uh, that they paid all this money for is out. And it looks horrible. And it all falls on me. And I got a lot of responsibility on me tomorrow. That's 15000 That's 9 and 15. Do the math. $24,000 worth of pressure. You know what it feels like? Come with me in the morning. You'll feel it. 
So I'm riding down the road. I say, Lord, whoa, I need thee every hour. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I need you. I said, Lord, uh, I need you here. What are we going to do? Well, just so happens, Brother Mark, the person that I'm working for is an engineer. Now, some of y'all don't have a clue what I've said, but I know my father, I mean, my son-in-law, it registered with him. They don't look at things within a quarter inch of tolerance. There's only zero tolerance. Within them clusters of pictures that she sent me, Brother Chuck, every one of them had a tape sticking on it showing me where it was out of line. Showing me where it was out of line. How you doing, friend? Make yourself at home. Don't worry about them. Good to see you. That's okay. It's never too late to be in the house of God. Tell me your name. I'll come back to my story, Ray. It's good to have you, buddy, okay? You want to stay and eat this taco night, Ray? You got to eat tacos. It's good to have you, buddy. She's staying. Anyway, back to the story. So this engineer that I'm working for and this $34,000 worth of cabin in granite, it is, are you ready? Five-eighths of an inch out. This cabinet has shifted five-eighths of an inch. Now somebody said, well, five-eighths of an inch. That's not big. I could live with that. You didn't pay 34000 for it to be right. And so when you go look at it, the cabinets have, have two angles in it. And those two angles right there where they're at, that granite is cut on a, on a, on a laser to where those angles meet up real pretty. They paid the whole bill, I promise you. But that cabinet's got to be moved five-eighths of an inch. Now keep in mind, on the bottom of that cabinet, Brother Chuck, it's been sealed with a granite sealer that bonds the stone to the cabinet. And I got to move it. Well, I promise you this much. If there was ever... Christian profanity, I would have used it that day, okay? But I didn't. I said, Lord, what I want to do is please you in this matter. I have no idea what I'm going to do, God. If you don't intervene and help me in this matter, somebody's buying $9,000 worth of granite. I mean, you say, why would you have to buy it? When you try to move that stone, if it cracks, do you really believe that engineer is going to let that stone stay there? I mean, serious. Would you? No. I wouldn't either. But remember, I told the granite lady it looked real good. She lied. <laughs> you didn't have your tape measure out. I didn't have my tape out. And she called me back, you know what she said? She said the good part is that when they shifted the granite in, they pulled it back. And the cabinet has been pulled outward to where it only has to be pushed inward. And then about the time it's ready to cut payroll, see this doesn't affect payroll, you got to pay people, you know. So I'm writing checks out, Chuck. And she said, uh, the engineer calls me and says, how you gonna fix it? How are you going to fix it? Well, I'd been praying. And I said, I think I got away. And I do. I think I got away. It didn't come from me. <laughs> I said, we're going to come over there and we're going to cut the bottom of that seal all the way around that granite on the bottom of that cabinet. We'll cut it all out real nice enough to make sure that there's at least a uh, knife cut through every bit of the caulk to where it's loose. And then we're going to put on this, hey, this tile. It, they, it, you can see it in the trailer. No, this tile's high end. Then we're going to take some, you're talking about stress now. Then we're going to take some towels and, and we're going to lay them down. We're going to take two or three and fold them up, double them up. And, put, and we're going to take hydraulic jacks. Y'all know what that is? We're going to take about four or five hydraulic jacks. And what we're going to do, we're going to take them jacks and put two-by-fours on them and put rags on the bottom. See, I'm all the time, tell me your name again. All the time trying to have to supervise. Ray, you ever been there? It's not really a blessing sometimes, is it? You'd like to go in and say, just handle it, and then you're buying 
$34,000 worth of. So you can't do that. Somebody's got to think about it. So I said, we're going to put that, we're going to put this, back on the phone with the engineer. I said, we're going to put this towels down on that tile. We're going to cut these two befores. We're going to wrap them and put foam on the top of them. And we're going to stick that two before it. And we're going to take that hydraulic jack and barely catch the bottom of that granite. Just enough to put tension on it. Just a little bit. And then one guy's going to be here, one's going to be there, and I'm going to be down there with a flashlight, and we're going to jack that stone up and raise it in the air where it's floating, where there's no way. There may be a sixteenth of an inch between the cabinet and the stone. And I said, then we're going to move that rascal. She said, where did you figure, how did you figure that out? <laughs> Oh, me. If people just let God be in their life, if they just live for God, if they just fall in love with God and honor God, God would solve so many things. Amen. And so tomorrow, the number one thing on my list, when I get up, I put my head on my pillow, Pleasing him. Just pleasing him. Stand with me if you would, please. Let me ask you something. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask you tonight. I appreciate your faithfulness in the house of God. You don't know it, but you came here tonight. You encouraged us, the heart of this preacher. I'm so glad you're here. Please stay with us afterwards. But why no one's looking around just for a moment? Maybe you'd say, preacher. I'm facing some things. I need the Lord's blessing on my life. I need God to help me through what I'm facing. Would you just slip your hand up real quick and let God bless you. God bless you. I see your hands. Many hands. Any others real quick? I'm looking. I see your hands. Praise the Lord. We'll be praying for you. Matter of fact, I'm going to do that now. And while we're praying, I'm going to pray for the meal. And when we're done... If you, if, you're, if you want to give the Sunday night offering uh, on the way out, Brother Paul or Brother Mark, one of them will be back there, if not both of them, and you can just slip your check on the way out. We appreciate that. That goes to the work of our church. Let me ask you also while you're praying, pray us up a van. I'm asking God for a 15-passenger van. We've already got a rider, our first rider, Brother Burl, was here this morning. We're asking God to fill it full of kids. Father, we love you today. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for these people, Lord. I, I don't know what they're facing, those who raised their hand. But Lord, you do. And I pray you'd give them wisdom. You're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And I pray, God, that you would bless us throughout the rest of this remainder of this service. And Lord, the fellowship, bless the food to nourish our bodies. Bless the time we have together. Father, uh, bless our offering. I'm asking you, Lord, for a van. And we're uh, promising that if you'll give us a van and you'll open doors, you'll, you'll, put, your, uh, you, you'll put your bullseye on a certain uh, apartment complex, a certain neighborhood, Lord, we'll pick these children up on this van and bring them in children's church and the children's ministry and do our very best to reach them for you, uh, presenting Christ. Amen? Amen? Father, bless us throughout this day, and I promise you for all you do and for everything you'll accomplish, we'll love you for it. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You're dismissed. Please, uh, on the way out, if you're able to give, you can give something. And uh, if you, hey, hey, you're going to give and receive.